Blessed are blah, blah, blah. blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is God's word. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Tyler. Let's let's pray once more before I begin. Can you pray with me? God, each and every one of us is here as a gift. We wake up and we know as we see the changing colors and we think how beautiful. As we see the sunrise, as we see the orange moon, we think, what does this all point to? And we know that this is the day the Lord has made, that we might rejoice and be glad through it to you in you and as we come into this space Lord might we be attentive as has already been emphasized might we take advantage of this moment that we have to know what it all points to I feel the weight of responsibility to help us through your words see you. I know apart from you, I cannot do it. And apart from you, none of us can grasp it. But by your spirit, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Open our eyes, Holy Spirit, to behold wondrous things in your law. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you, and it is good to share the word with you. As we consider our new mission statement as a church, which we introduced uh, a month or so back, as a background to our study of the Sermon on the Mount, I can't help but today's verse, which Tyler read for us, notice that this verse absolutely nails it on the head, what we're seeking through having a mission statement. And just to remind us, uh, our mission statement that we shared um, is, is this. It'll be on the screen. As the Crossroads Missionary Church, we exist for people to behold the glory of God, belong to Jesus and his family, and become disciples living by the Holy Spirit. You see that posted up above the door frame as you come into the sanctuary, because that's what we're seeking to do here. So that all will know Jesus, be known by Jesus, and make Jesus known. What do we mean by these words? What's, what's their meaning? What's their purpose? Because as I think we emphasize enough, it's not just so that we have a mission statement and are cool and with the trend. No, it, it actually serves a purpose. More specifically, the three B's capture this how. How do we do ministry? How do we seek to make disciples that live um, after God, right? These three B's help us to focus that and check all that we do in order to go the way of God through Scripture, how He directs us that way. We all, I think we can all be agreed. We want to go the way God wants us to through His Scripture. So first of all, obviously, we're going to look to God. We're going to behold Him. As I was thinking this week on this verse, which we're going to work through today, I remembered a moment. Um, I don't know how old I was. I think I was maybe a teenager or younger And I don't know if it was inspired by this verse or another, but I remember asking God, pleading with God, with painful longing, I was like, God, show me yourself. And I meant, what I meant by that is I wanted him to physically manifest in front of me. I just thought, if if God would just show me, if I could just beg enough and I could see him, I would know without a doubt. Of course, nothing happened. There was no manifestation, no physical you know, enigma that happened in front of me. No, 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 that nothing happened, right? Does that make God a liar, right? Jesus, the son of God himself, says it right here. They shall see God. We get to see God. And there's other moments throughout the Bible that we see people have encounters with God. They see this manifestation of God. So what does he mean? Now, I don't want to to get distracted in the rabbit trails and the, you know, the untrivial questions. But I also don't want us to skim too quickly over these words of Jesus, the Son of God. We can see God. 
He, he promised. Now, you get that. That, that, that. that statement means a promise. It's a definitive statement. He says, they shall see God. As Charles Spurgeon says, the wills and shalls in the Bible, they are definitive statements. They're promises. Whatever it means, it's a promise. Do you want to see God? Would you want to see? I think if anybody were offered the opportunity and promised that they would see God, they would take the opportunity. I certainly would. I tried as a little, as a little boy. I wanted to see God. And here it is, spoken by God incarnate, the one who actually did manifest himself on earth. Looking out at a crowd of people as I look out on you right now and as God looks and sees, he's present with us here and he sees as he saw in that people that he was preaching to, but all these crowd of people who have walked through a complex span of pain, physically, emotionally, mentally, and he's bringing this kingdom saying, this is what you need. People who have been through setback and rejection People who are currently walking through and will walk through challenges and suffering of all kinds. And he promises, you come into my kingdom and you're going to walk this life and enjoy the company of the king through it all. So my kingdom offers you, blessed are the pure in heart, for in all that you go through, you shall see God. So I want to start there. I want to start there with this promise they shall see God. Because that's, that's a loaded statement, right? What does he mean, right? Does he mean that God will physically mani manifest himself to us? And if he doesn't, then there's something wrong with you? Why didn't Jesus start with this one if he's trying to lay out the blessings and benefits of his kingdom, right? Why don't you just start with that? Jesus, we get to see God. Why doesn't he start with that? Well, it's along those lines, we remember that there actually is deliberate order to Jesus' statements here in Matthew chapter 5. By the way, if you don't have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5, I encourage you to do that now. In Matthew chapter 5, he begins with these statements of Beatitudes, and there's deliberate order. And I want us to see something about that order, right? If I can just get a little geeky on you right now. You look at verse 3, which is the Beatitude, that's the, the first Beatitude, and you look at verse 10, they both end with the same reason for... The blessed life. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Right? They both end with that. In, in, in grammatical, contextual clues, this is widely seen as the bookends of this portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. His sermon's broken up into different sections, not just three chapters, but different things that he's hitting on. So if this is the case, in th verse 3 to, and 10 are the bookends, then there are eight Beatitude statements. Right? And I know there's another blessed are you, and we'll get to what that means later on. And in these eight Beatitude statements, I personally see that verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, is this pivot point in this section. Right? This pivot point. Last week we saw how the merciful are such, they are merciful as an outflow of their pursuing of righteousness. It, 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 that mercy is a fruit of a righteous life. And the same could be said of being pure in heart and peacemakers, especially with the contextual note on the last beatitude, verse 10, says that blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, right? So you're, you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and in verse 10 says you're persecuted for that type of life, meaning that everything that kind of flows out of that, being a pure in heart, being merciful, being pure in heart, being a peacemaker is the type of life that is righteous and is liable to be persecuted for. So if all of this is the case, the latter four Beatitudes, verses 7 through 10, flow out of the former four Beatitudes. Now, why did I just do all that brainy work? Why doesn't Jesus start with seeing God? Why does he put it almost kind of in the middle, not really? Why does he do that? Because I think some other focuses have to be covered before we can see God. Not everybody just gets to see God, right? And we'll get to why that, that, why that is. So, some of the things that we've got to go through to see God, but what does it mean to see God? And this is important because, as I started with, this is what we want to strive for at Crossroads. And just as the family of God and individual followers of God, in everything we do, we want to see and help others see God. That's what behold means. In the Old Testament and New Testament, the word for behold simply means see, right? So throughout the how many 
what, 1,500 times we said, um, that behold is used in the Bible. He's saying, look, see, focus your attention to. That's what we want to do. When Jesus says they shall see God here, he's not meaning, obviously, a physical manifestation and a physical perceiving of God. But don't, don't get caught up there. Because that also does not mean that the experience of spiritually seeing and knowing God is dulled or unstimulating or less amazing and exciting, right? It doesn't make a difference. Would, being, would eating food blindfolded dull or hinder your sense of taste, right? No, you could still taste the food, right? In another sense, the spiritual experience of encountering God would assimilate every sensory experience and far surpass them. So don't be inhibited by Jesus not saying that you'll physically see God because what he does mean far surpasses any sort of experience and is not hindered by anything. So we're going to see God. And that's an amazing thing. But in order for me to explain why that's an amazing thing, I'm forced to try to answer the question, who is God, right? Why? Because the experience of the perceiving, the experience of spiritually perceiving is heightened or dulled by the object focused on, right? There's a different experience between you shaking my hand and shaking perhaps Billy Graham's hand, right? There's a difference because Billy Graham is Billy Graham and I'm just me, right? There's a difference between your perceiving of the St. Joseph River versus seeing the Mississippi River or the Colorado or the Congo or the Amazon, right? There's a difference because of the, of the one being, the object being focused on. Or seeing the Smoky Mountains versus seeing the Himalayas. There's a difference. So comparatively speaking to all other focuses, what is it like to see God? Who is God? When we talk about the one we call Yahweh, which we talked about last week, the God of the Bible, the one true creator, the all-encompassing term that we use to describe this God is his glory, right? That's the all-encompassing term. How could we possibly describe God? Well, the Bible points us to the glory of God. We exist for people to behold, see the glory of God. And this is the reality. Again, the scriptures unceasingly highlight with unity. They point to the glory. And from the Faith Life Study Bible, which when Jordan and I preached together, this was his contribution, so I'm, I have to give credit, credit to Faith Life Study Bible explains it this way. When the Bible speaks of God's glory, it means that God has infinite intrinsic worth. His character and essence are worthy of, high, of honor and the highest esteem. Infinite intrinsic worth. That's what glory means. And as an effect, he's worthy of the honor and highest esteem. In general and universally, when we're talking about God, right, because everybody can say God and they believe in a God and and try to describe him and with not necessarily being a Christian. What are we talking about when we say God, no matter what background you come from? When we're talking about God, we're talking about the supreme being in simple terms. If a God were to exist, that being by definition would be a maximally great and powerful being. That's what we mean by God. But not only that, but if that being were this maximally great one, that would mean that he, or you know, this being God, is worthy of the highest worship. Because we, we worship, we praise, we honor that which is great in our sight. So your team that maybe won or lost yesterday, ours won, yeah, or will win or lose today, right? You follow them, you hold them up as great, certain players you hold up as great, and anything else that you hold up as great, in a sense, you are worshiping that. So if God is maximally great, He's worthy of the highest worship. Now, if you believe in the God of the Bible, which if you're here, you're listening online, I am assuming that you do know the God of the Bible or you're desiring to know more and find out more about this God, we believe that Yahweh is the one true creator God 
who is eternally supreme and glorious. He's self-sufficient in himself and unchanging in who he is. But why did this eternal, supreme, and self-sustaining God create something outside himself if he needs nothing else to be who he is? He is great and supreme and glorious and self-sustaining. He doesn't need anything else. We tried to we hit on this last week. Why did he create anything else if he doesn't need anything else? And just so I don't spend too much time lingering on this, simply, if God is, by the nature of his being, his, his glory, the greatest reality, which Yahweh means I am, simply he is reality and the greatest reality. If he is such, the greatest reality, and therefore worthy of the highest worship, God created for his nature to be known, to be seen, to be worshipped. God wants to be seen. So his motivation to create was for the creation to look on him, to see him, to see what is so maximally great about him and love it and enjoy it and worship him. Now, we may be tempted to think that that's selfish, right? That that's selfish. He wants my worship. He wants to be seen and known, right? But we must remember, well, we, we think that'd be selfish because that's selfish in humans, right? Um, there was something, a blurb, I think, about pastor appreciation, right? And, you know, and, and I, I love that and all. And I, you know, I'm appreciative of your appreciation. Um, where was I going with this? And it's not, it's not wrong to appreciate something or someone, right? But it'd be weird if I demanded your appreciation. I did not put that in there. I didn't even plan for that to be in there, right? Belinda put that in there. And it's not wrong for me to be appreciated. But I was thinking this week, and as I prayed, I was like, I am burdened by the responsibility to share the word of God. How could I possibly speak words to make you see God, right? That, that's just always daunting to me at the beginning of the week as I start to study. I'm like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to write something that's going to encapsulate God, right? But my duty in order to be appreciated would not to be for me to be appreciated, but a point to the one to whom all appreciation belongs. And so we're talking about the God who is worthy of the highest worship. He's not like us. It's not selfish for him. It's actually owing to him what he is due he is worthy of the highest worship and delight because he is the greatest and highest reality in and outside of the universe. Therefore, seeing God is the highest and the greatest possible experience. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about seeing God. The highest and greatest possible experience. This character of God to, for himself to be known and himself to be loved in relationship with his people, his creation is further seen and solidified in the person of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews says of him, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Whatever God is by his definition, it is manifested in Jesus. And John writes in his gospel, the fourth book of the New Testament, in John chapter 1, verse 14, on the screen, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, his infinite intrinsic worth, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. He's eternal. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. But the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. God wants to be known. He wants us to know him and enjoy knowing him and, and, and enjoy living after him. And does he ever shout this truth in grace and love and mercy through his incarnation in Jesus Christ. That's proof that God wants to be seen. But not only just to be seen, but beholding the glory of God 
also is the seeing of, his, of the expressions of his glory. Right? Not just that he is glorious, but that he does glorious things. The act of creation was this expression of his glory. He, it was motivated by the desire to share himself. Right? Who he is can be clearly seen in just the fact that he created. That's his purpose as the supremely great and delightful being. And God has been active ever since, working his will for his glorious purpose in the world. Of course, we don't all the time see this or get this or understand that. Paul writes about this to the Roman churches, saying, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We see that that's just an opposite statement of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And, and, and by that, you get to get to this point where you see God. But this, this group, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, his glory, have been clearly perceived clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made so they are without excuse the heavens declare the glory of god right it is clear throughout creation god is working to make himself known so that seeing is a perception spiritual perception of god's glorious nature and seeing the expressions of his glorious nature that he's at work see the people of god and if you are in Christ through faith, you have this opportunity and this privilege of seeing, of knowing, and enjoying this God in ways nobody else can know. The world cannot know. The world can think that they know and make conclusions about God and, and the truth of Him, but in reality, spiritual insight is only given to those inside the kingdom. Those are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But dwell on that. All we've just been saying, God wants us to see him. He wants you to see him. And not only know him and see him, but see that he's at work. He is working in your life so that you know him. He's at work in the world. And even when you can't see it, even when you can't perceive it, feel like you can experience him, is he real? Is he working? Is he here? Is he absent? He is. And if we can't see it now, we'll see it eventually. There's plenty else to see in the world that would make us perhaps think otherwise, that God is good, God is working, right? But the people of God know. People of God know that this is, this is what God is like. This is what he means to do in creation, and he is doing. They see God in the expressions of his glory at work. But as I'm talking about the people of God, being the ones that get to see God, I need to now focus on those people, right? What is the quality of the people who are privileged to see God? As Martin Lloyd-Jones would point out, the emphasis of this statement is not necessarily on the seeing of God, but on the question, what's the state of my heart? What's the state of my heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If God is who he says he is, this will compel us to examine who we are. Why? Because he says the pure in heart will see God. That's, that's a condition. That is the quality of those who are, get to experience the blessed life, the greatest and highest of all possible experience. Not everybody can just see God. There's a condition and I want to simply state and then work off this thought. Purity of heart is the compatibility of our spiritual life to see God more fully. When we're talking about purity of heart. How does that get us to the place where we can see God? It's, it's this compatibility of our spiritual life to see God more fully. So what's the state of my heart? Is it compatible? Is it not? What is he talking about here? Well, the heart... In the Greek, it's cardia, where we get cardiology. 
the heart is referred to over 800 times throughout the whole Bible, in the Old Testament, New Testament. And in these 800 times, it's never as referring to that four-chambered blood pump that, incidentally, Kate and I got to see on an ultrasound. It's never referring to a, the body part, right? It's never. But it's referred to over 800 times, so obviously it's important. Uh, this definition describes this reality as the effective center of our being. It's the heart. The effective center of our being. The center and seat of the spiritual life. The fountain, the seat of the thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. Center, core to us. John Eldridge calls it the epicenter of our life with God. This is absolutely central to seeing God. Obvious, as, as the Bible would point out. It's vital to our being as people. As vital as your physical heart is to your physical body, so is the spiritual state of your heart to your spiritual life because we are full beings. We're not just physical. We are spiritual as well. And Jesus says this, this absolutely vital and essential part of who you are must be pure. It must be unstained. It must be guiltless. It must be upright. It must be unmixed, pure. And the assumption is that your heart is, our hearts are not naturally that way. Our hearts are naturally stained, guilty, not right. They are mixed. They're unpure. It's not compatible to your experience, to experience the greatest of all possible realities which God made us for. Something has gone wrong to blind us from seeing. Now, this is important because there's an essential difference between a person who's in the kingdom and a person who's outside the kingdom. And so we need to focus on what makes that difference. The message version puts this beatitude this way, and I, I wouldn't use the message version normally unless it actually hit at the, the meaning here. Um, so I did the word study, and then I looked at this, and I saw, oh, that really frames it really well. It says, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart, put right. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart, put right. I think the problem addressed here is that we tend to the problem addressed is the mistaken motivation that we have to get our outside world right to make our inside world feel better. Right? It, it's flipped. Right? Jesus is saying, get your inside world right and the outside world later. Right? That'll follow. But we have this mistaken problem of doing the opposite. And the Pharisees, who doubtless were hearing this, they did this as well. The so-called religious leaders, the shepherds of the people, they put the burden of legalism on people to be ritually purified, and they themselves strive for their outside world to be put right, while neglecting the more important aspect of who we are in the effective center of our being in life with God. Now, Jesus does ta talk more practically later on. But as I said last week, uh, the, the gospel, it, it deals immediately more with who we are before we, what we do. You know, who we are before what we do. So we're going to go practical later, but we need to focus on, okay, who am I really? In our modern moment today, you and I, we too can be so burdened by and burden others with our criteria for the blessed life. You, you need to do this, and you need to have this, and have done this by this age, and you need to teach your kids, and not that. You need to you do this, and not, you know, and not the other. Right? Do this, do that, don't do that, and on and on. And by effect, focusing on our inside world becomes secondary or unnecessary. And I was so rocked by this last night as I was going over this, and I had to add it to my notes, because the irony is that when we neglect our inside world, the outside world gets worse. When we neglect the inside world, the outside world gets worse. What's the, what's the real problem with the world? Not that we need more of these policies and that need to happen out in the outside world and this person needs to do that rather than that. And 
just screaming at each other when the real problem isn't even on the outside, it's on the inside. What's the real issue? The mind and the heart. What leads people to do horrible things? Deplete, depleted levels of health in the mind and the heart. Our way is usually to focus on the outward life to achieve the best possible reality we can for ourselves and for our kids and for our spouse and, and for, our, you know, for our businesses and, and for everything. Focusing on the outside, get that right so that my inside will be better. But what if I spend my life pursuing the outward state of my life being such and such and so, neglect the inward, come to the end, I'm standing before God and find out, brother, you... You focus on the wrong thing, right? In the kingdom, the heart is the emphasis if you want to come into a life that is truly blessed. Now, the outward life is important, and there are certain responsibilities that we need to be wise about, right? And not just forget it, right? But it's not first. It's not primary, because we won't do it right. We won't be responsible. We won't be wise until our mind and heart are put right. Pure in heart shall see God. Pure in heart shall see God. One commentary points out that the expression has its origin in the ways of Eastern monarchs or kings and queens who rarely show themselves in public so that the, on, the only the most intimate circle behold the royal countenance. Only the most intimate so that the pure have access to the all but inaccessible. These pure in heart that get to see God are part of the most intimate circle. You just think about that. You know, it's kind of, we're kind of far removed from that idea. But this is how they would have been thinking in the biblical texts. They would have been thinking like this. And Jesus would have been talking like this, trying to appeal to them and, and understand this. I thought of this in the story uh, of Esther. Esther, who's a, a Jew and becomes the queen in Persia. And, you know, the story goes on, and she finds out there's a plan against her people, the Jewish people, to be destroyed. And her cousin Mordecai is like, you could have been put in this position of power and influence for such a time as this. Now go appeal to the king. And so she has this opportunity, and so she has a plan. And in Esther chapter 5, we read this. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes, stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters. While the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. I just want to stop there for a second and just think about that. You know, it's, it's, the scene is set, right? And you have to close your eyes and think about it, right? She, she's about to go into the king, to the throne where he's sitting on his throne. And so she's like, okay, I'm going to think differently about what I put on. All right, I'm going to grab my royal robes and put them, be presentable before the king. I'm proper, compatible to be in his presence. And then she goes to stand in the inner court, which is inside the, the, the throne room, right? She's going into the inner, to the inner. And you just, you just think about the architecture and you just the, the solemnity of the moment. And she's standing before this king. Even though she's the queen, she's taking precaution for how she's presenting herself before the king. She's not going into this flippantly or lightly or ignorantly or naively. She's thinking very critically about what she does. Okay, go on. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. You think about that. Now God is different. But how much more true is the attitude that we have toward approaching the throne room of God? How much more true of the king of the universe do we need to take precaution, think critically about how we come into the presence of the holy, almighty, perfect, almighty God? I said almighty twice because he's almighty. Do we think critically about, do we understand that, that seeing him is not boring? Seeing God is not a light thing. Coming to His presence is not something that we just walk into. And we're a little bit more casual about it, 
right? And that's okay. But at the same time, it can cause us to have a lowered sense of reverence and forget the fear of God. The, what the New Old Testament says, the fear of God is Israel's treasure. It's something I hold on to and, and, and cherish. Think differently about how we approach the, the God. What does it mean to really see God? Now, what are you saying? That there are things that I have to do in order to be acceptable to God and present myself well. You know, I got to do this and this and this. I thought we were talking about that there's nothing I can do to be able to be in a relationship with God. Well, here's where we need to address a similar issue as last week in verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You know, what are you saying? I, I'm not going to get mercy from God unless I show mercy. See, the seeing of God as well as the being shown mercy are simultaneously a past, present, and future reality. A past, present, and future reality. See, already we know, yes, in order to come into God's kingdom, in order to come into relationship with God, it is by the grace of God alone in Jesus Christ alone. The grace and mercy and love and the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. Yes, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses. It purifies. It's the same word used in Matthew chapter 5. Cleanses us of all sin. That's his gift. Which, that purifying, cleansing, is actually an act of seeing through faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We could not see it. We were blind. We could not see it. And he shone it into our hearts so that we could see, be, be purified, and come into the kingdom. That's the past reality. That's the past work of being purified and seeing God. Now, the future reality is regardless, all of us are going to see God. All of us are going to see God, regardless if you have had faith in Jesus Christ or not. All of us will stand, all of us will be beckoned into the throne room, commanded into the throne room. You will come before the king. What am I wearing? What does my heart look like? Is it pure? Did I think critically about that before I came? Even in salvation, we can neglect the gift of being pure in heart by not living in the present after a pure heart. Because sin, which makes us impure, which makes us blind, still threatens us today still threatens us in this hour, right? Some of you perhaps are thinking about something in your life that's like, man, if I could just get over that, I'm with you. If I could just get past that, it still is holding me back. I need to throw it off so I can run my race. Sin still threatens us today. And verse four told us that. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn over the presence of sin in your life, and you will receive the refreshing grace of God to overcome it. So it still threatens us today. So we still got to daily pursue this purity of heart, but it's not something that adds to what Christ lacks in doing. Christ finished it, right? He purified us. We're in a relationship with God, but in that relationship with God, we got to continue running with the race with endurance, with perseverance. And so what I'm talking about here is persevering in faith to see. As sin is still threatening us, we persevere over it in faith to see the glory of God. My sort of uh, summary description of this beatitude is that the kingdom citizen focuses on their inner life being presentable before the king. We have a driving desire after the righteousness of God, which will in turn lead to this, okay, is my inner life right? Is it presentable? for a continued relationship of a, a personal, firsthand relationship with God? Am I persevering in faith so that that happens? So I just want to end by answering the question, how do I persevere in faith to see and so keep my inside world right, pure, so that I can see God? 
How do I persevere in faith to see? And I'm looking at Psalm 24 to help us answer this question. Psalm 24, verse 3 through 6. Who shall ascend the hill of Yahweh? And who shall stand in his holy place? Let's stop right there. You just think about the question there. Who gets to see God? Who gets to stand in the throne room? Who gets to be in his presence? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, does not swear deceitfully, he will, shall receive, will receive blessing from Yahweh. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. And that word Selah in the Psalms simply means, let me just stop and think about that for a second. So let's, do, let's stop and think about that for a second. Who gets to ascend? Who gets to stand in the presence of Yahweh, the God of the universe, the maximally great one, worthy of the highest worship? Who gets to do that? The clean hands, pure in heart, does not lift the soul to his false, swear deceitfully who receives blessing and righteousness from the God of Jacob, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Who, I mean, it's not a trick question, who gets to see God? Those who seek God. Who gets to see God? Those who seek him, those who desire him, those who are pursuing, hungering and thirsting after righteousness to see God. How do we become pure in heart, pure in heart disciples living by the Holy Spirit, as is our third B, in order to behold the glory of God? Well, it's very simply and kind of confusingly. We behold God in order to become pure, and we become pure in order to behold God. And you just think about that for a second. It was in seeing God through faith that we became pure through the blood of Jesus Christ. It was a gift. We became pure. But now we strive and continue to chase after this life of being pure in heart so that we can continue to see God. If he, uh, not Ephesians. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, um, the writer of Hebrews says, seek after, strive after the holiness without which no one will see God. It's the same sort of idea. There's got to be this, uh, this type of nature that you have, this type of essence, this character that you have that is compatible to see God. Are we living by the Holy Spirit? Are we living into that which God opens us up to? We behold God, and we could just add in there, by belonging to Him to become pure. Keep going around and around. I read this week a quote by Jonathan Edwards, uh, 18th century preacher, theologian, pastor, and this, just, just put it in perspective for me so well. And I put it on the back of your note sheet so you can look at it later because, again, this is 1700s, a really smart guy. This is part of his dissertation. But it's so beautiful, the way he words this. So, look with me. There are many reasons to think that what God has in view in an increasing communication of himself through eternity is an increasing knowledge of God, love to him, Enjoy in him. So that first sentence is just what I've been saying from the beginning. God is communicating himself. He's sharing himself. He's making himself known. That's, why he, that's what he means by communication. And his purpose for that is to be known, be loved, and be enjoyed by us. For us to enjoy that. He goes on. And it is to be considered that the more those divine communications increase in the creature, that is us, the more it becomes one with God. For so much the more it is united to God in love, the heart is drawn nearer and nearer to God. And the union with him becomes more firm and close. And at the same time, the creature becomes more and more conformed to God. The image is more and more perfect. So the good that is in the creature comes forever nearer and nearer to an identity with that which is in God. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 
Isn't that so evident there? We, through a relationship with God, beholding Him, are coming nearer to Him. And by coming nearer to Him, we get to see Him better because we're one, more and more one with Him. I thought of it like this, like a window. There, we got windows in here. They're shut, so it's not going to help me. But like a window, the clearer or purer the glass, the more we can see through the glass to experience the reality on the other side. The more we are clear and pure like God, the more we can see what He wants wants us to show show us. Like a diamond. And you ladies have diamonds on your ring. The clearer or purer the diamond, you know the four, four C's, clarity? The clearer or purer the diamond, the more it catches the glimmer and glory of the sun's rays, which heightens the experience of seeing the diamond, but would not be possible without the sun, and so glorifies the sun. So we too, in our inner world, when our inner world is pure, when it's more compatible with a life in God, increasingly like Him in true righteousness, because we've been hungering and thirsting after it and He's been giving it to us, we can more fully see the greatest of all realities and experience the most enjoyable of all experiences. That is the reality and experience of seeing the glory of God. God wants us to see Him. God wants you to see him and not just see him and for who he is but see him at work revealing who he is through works and in the world he is at work in the world and we can we can see him by drawing nearer to god and he will draw near to you and you shall see god that's an outflow of the hungering and thirsting after righteousness so pursue righteousness right and you will see god right Open the Word of God. So how are we gonna how are we gonna see God? We're gonna open the Word of God. That's how that's what we're gonna do here in the church when we're gathered together. This is foundational to who we are and what we do. But personally, open the word. See God. Open the word and pray. Lord, open my eyes to behold wondrous things from your law. Open the eyes of my heart that I may know you better. And He will. And He will. All you got to do is see. If you need a Bible, right? If you don't have a personal Bible, we will get you a Bible. We will give you a Bible and help you find one that, that works well for you. But we get to see God. So pursue righteousness. Open the word. Look. See. Behold. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you. That your unchanging purpose since the beginning of the world was that we would know you and see you. We love you and enjoy everything that you show us. Father, we ask, and I ask for these and myself, that you would open the eyes of our hearts that we may know you better, as Paul writes to the Ephesians. That you would help us to hunger and thirst after righteousness and come to this place where our lives are becoming one with you. Lord, help us as a church to focus on what's more important. Help me to lead in such a way where I pay attention to the spiritual health and the mind and the hearts of these people and in my own family and each of us in our own families. Help us to turn to you. Not try to fix the outside world so that my inside world feels better, but to focus on the more important and allow you to lead me to make the outside world a better place out of a relationship with you. Jesus, we pray that this afternoon is just filled with a a new insight into how you are working in our lives and in in this world. And And to know it in faith that even when we can't see, you are working. Lord, we pray for those who are in other places, part of our family. 
Lord, that you, even though they're not with us in body, they are in, with us in spirit, would you give them fresh sight today of your glory? Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gifts that you give us, namely your Son, and through him the Holy Spirit, that we may have a relationship with you. If there's anyone in here with your eyes bowed, or your eyes closed, your heads bowed, if there's anybody in here that does not know Jesus as your personal Savior, and so I've come into this place where you can see God, I just ask that you come talk with me. Come go talk with the trusted person, friend, parent, somebody, to discover what it means to chase after a life of knowing God, loving Him, living for Him. God, may you Lead us there. Lead us there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me before we go? Send you off with a blessing. Would you open your hands toward heaven, receive a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and may you see that and enjoy it and receive what it gives you in order to pursue his life. May you have fresh insight to how he's working in your life and how he wants to use your life to show others his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Go know Jesus, be known by Jesus, and make Jesus known.